Welcome to the Runic Commerce 64 Talk. I'm David Yowd here at Virtual CRX 2021. Uh, this is pre-recorded. Unfortunately, I trashed my voice yesterday, so I'm down in the Patrick Warburton range. Uh, but QA will be live, so hopefully I'll be back to my normal speaking timbre by then. Like other presenters this weekend, I'm really looking forward to when we get to meet uh, back in person in Las Vegas again. But these virtual conferences have been reaching uh, large audiences, and that's good. Anyway, let's jump in. So here's the Runic Commodore 64. Uh, as you can see, the keys all look a little strange. I think it looks pretty cool. So let's do a pan over the keyboard. Uh, everybody here knows the key layout, so you could figure out the symbol mappings pretty quickly without doing any kind of Googling. Um, and when we turn on the Commodore, you'll see they're on the inside as well. And there they are. So let's discuss what Ultima Runic is. Uh, first of all, that guy on the top right, that's Richard Garriott there. Uh, he created the groundbreaking Ultima game series, which had about a good two-decade run. If you read Geek News, you've likely heard of Garriott's adventures as a private astronaut who has visited the International Space Station. Uh, he's also explored the North and South Poles. He goes on deep ocean dives. Uh, where he's explored the wreckage of the Titanic. Uh, he also descended nearly seven miles down to the Mariana Trench, where it was 1,800, sorry, 18,000 pounds per square inch of pressure. Uh, so this guy does crazy stuff. And it all started back when he was writing 8-bit RPGs. Um, in his Ultima games, he used runic symbols in both the gameplay that you encountered and the feelies. Uh, these were things that came with the game, like the game's uh, cloth maps. And these symbols were inspired by uh, J.R.L. Tolkien's uh, The Hobbit, so you might be uh, familiar with those dwarf runes from those books as well. It's effectively a simple substitution cipher. All the letters A through Z are mapped to a particular uh, glyph. But there's additional two-letter symbols. I'll either be calling them bigrams or ligatures. And these are sim single symbols for E, 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 A, NG, ST, and TH. So that's a total of 31 symbols. So if I had like the word the, uh, that would not be shown as a three letter word, but it'd be a two letter word, uh, the TH symbol and the E symbol. So here's some runic sightings for those who have played the Ultima games. You've undoubtedly encountered a runic, uh, which you probably had to translate. It showed up in a number of places. So at Commodore events, many folks bring their pimped out C64s, and I never had a pimped out C64. So I thought it was time to make one that represented the kinds of things I liked back in my teen formative years. And I had a few design goals. I wanted a physical switch to be able to turn on and off the runic behavior. So when it was off, it would behave like a normal Commodore. And when it's in runic mode, I want to have a high level of compatibility so I can pull existing software in and mess with it in runic space. The basic keywords and variables need to be able to support the five um, two-letter runic ligatures that I just talked about. Um, and I wanted intuitive access to these ligatures, so they're on the front of the keys, not the top of the keys. And the front of the keys meaning that they're accessible when the shift key is down. So their placement is chosen so that they're associated with a key that shares a letter in the ligature. For example, shift N gives you the NG symbol. I say intuitive, but of course intuitive doesn't mean obvious, it just means easier to remember once you know. Uh, in the pan over, you saw the switch that allows for the dual boot, the uh, normal and the runic mode. If you look at the ready prompt, um, you can see that the runic version down there has four letters. Again, that's because there was a EA was one of the ligatures and it's been replaced by a single symbol. And this is what uh, basic looks like. On the left is when you boot up in the normal mode, on the right in the runic mode, of course. You can see I've circled the word peak. If you load this program, you'll see the peak statement written out that way. If you load it in runic mode, you'll see that it's been collapsed down to three characters using the, the ligature. So all basic keywords get translated into runic. If you know a little bit about Commodores, uh, each basic keyword is stored as a specific byte value. That is its token value. That's how it's stored in memory and on disk. And both in normal and runic modes, um, 
encode and decode to the same token values for compatibility. So this is a look at the inside of the Commodore. That is the switch um, that switches between three ROMs. Um, the character generator ROM, as you saw, the characters look different, uh, the Commodore kernel, and the Commodore basic. So the basic and kernel have to be changed in a number of ways, um, but one of them is all of these ligatures, right? These two letter symbols occur quite frequently in the basic keywords and in system and error messages that are throughout the basic and the kernel. So all of those were changed. So the goal was for the basic keywords and variables to be able to use the ligatures however they wanted to. Uh, this approach of having them be shifted characters came with some costs because the shifted characters on the Commodore have their highest bit set when you do the shifting. The ROMs, both the basic and the kernel, use that highest bit to flag certain kinds of operations. They mark the end of user entered basic abbreviations. Uh, they delimit the table of basic command name strings and they add type info to variable name strings. I think there's some other things that it does as well. So what the challenge is, is for me, it was to implement these shifted ligatures, but minimally disturb the ROM logic. So I don't have a whole lot of room to make these patches. And on that topic, you have to work within your own footprint. So finding unused areas in the ROM, they're pretty scarce when you're trying to hook these things. So a little bit of background on shifted characters in Petsky. Petsky, of course, is the Commodore 64's ASCII. I have uh, two charts here from PageTable, great site. Uh, on the left is the default character set when you first turn on the Commodore. On the right-hand side is when you switch it to mixed case. And these examples are going to be easier to see on the mixed case example on the right. So when you enter letters A through Z, they're in the range starting with 65 like you probably expect if you're used to ASCII. When you shift them, they go into that lower part right there, the capital letters you see on the right-hand side, uh, down in the eighth bit range that start at number 193. But for probably for interoperability reasons, although I'd love to hear in Q&A if that's not the reason it's here, uh, those shifted letters are in there twice in, that you see. It's easier to see on the mixed case side. So they're there again in the range from 97 to 122, and it turns out that's going to help provide the solution to this problem I had. So my approach is to use that lower range that doesn't have the highest bit set. And the way I did this is I modify the basic ROM so that the buffer of that holds all this stuff to be tokenized by basic first moves the shifted glyphs into that alternative lower range that starts at 97 instead, so they don't have that highest bit set. And the pros of this is this allows me to have that intuitive keyboard shortcut that I wanted for the ligatures. The cons are, in making these patches the way that I did, uh, I lose most of the use of basic token abbreviations. For those who don't know, like if you're going to enter the word poke, that would be the letter P, and then you'd hit shift O instead of typing in P-O-K-E. The abbreviations aren't actually stored. Um, once they've been tokenized, it's the token that's stored. It's just a faster way of entering code. I never really did it all that much back in the day, which is why I thought it was a great thing to sacrifice, but other people will probably uh, not like that. The existing basic programs, this is another con, that read shifted characters from keyboard input uh, would need to use that alternative 7-bit range. So for instance, if your basic said, if ASC dollar sign uh, of a string, you know, equals 193, you would need to change that to 97 instead. So there's a couple incompatibilities, but I think I could live with all those. So here's the first patch, patch number one. Uh, this patch allows shifted characters of our choosing, of the ligature specifically, to be successfully tokenized by basic. And this is typical of a patch. I'm not going to go too deep into it. You find an entry point, uh, you redirect it to your own code, and then you jump back, right? And this patch made use of 30 unused bytes that were in the basic ROM area. There's all those AAAAs that you see over there. And I used every one of those bytes. I had to squeeze it down, like not set flags when I didn't know their values, things like that. But I got it to fit. Uh, the second patch. This next patch allows the uh, ligatures to be used in variable names, which I think is cool. Now, I could have taken the Jiffy DOS kind of approach and just overwrote parts of the kernel that handle the tape storage because NTSC users rarely want the tape handling. But I really didn't want to sacrifice that. So what I sacrificed instead, which is kind of unconventional, is all the default positions of the sprites on boot. 
So hopefully people didn't rely too much on the default sprite positions, um, or else that will be another incompatibility. One special case that I had to handle was the reserved variable st. Uh, st is not a basic command, therefore it does not have a basic token associated with it. So I didn't get that compatibility automatically that I was with all the other basic commands. For compatibility with existing code that uses st, I had to replicate with the uh, ligature symbol, but not replace the letters st. So both of these work in exactly the same way. Uh, for those who don't know, st is a reserved variable that returns the status of certain I.O. operations. And I have a couple of cases on there on the screen that I won't go into that just shows how both st and the ligature work in exactly the same way on some kinds of edge cases. So I'm not going to say much about this patch, uh, except that I'm grateful that the kernel also had unused bytes in it. Um, you can see all those AAs down there. And again, that was the perfect tidy hole to tuck this patch away in. On to the keycaps. So the keycaps that you saw in the Runic Commodore, as well as the Runic symbols in these slides, they all come from an Ultima Runic font that's been floating around forever, at least since the late 90s, uh, created by Micro Dragon. If you're in the UDIC group, uh, you've undoubtedly used this font or been forced to read it at uh, some point. I had to uh, use FontForge, which is a free piece of software, to add a few more glyphs that I need on the keys and also to make some various changes to them because they were too close together when I was trying to 3D print them. So the keycap models went through this workflow. First of all, I started with Jacob Bullock's Commodore 64 keycap models. That was a big leg up. Those are those bubblegum looky um, pink keycaps you see on the left there. I have a link to them there. Uh, they're a very useful starting point. Then I used a mesh mixer. This is a free tool to create blank keys. So I had to scrub the Commodore shapes off of there. Now Commodore keyboard has 66 keys. There were only 10 unique key shapes, so I only had to scrub it 10 times. And then I used a program called Fusion 360, the free version of that, to rebuild these models. I basically took these simple models and made a more complex model with a whole bunch of triangles. The reason I had to do that is because in step four, I used a program called OpenSCAD. And OpenSCAD likes to blow up um, on STL models. I don't know enough to know why it does. Even STL models that are built with OpenSCAD seem to make OpenSCAD blow up, but the, the trick is to rebuild them with lots of triangles first. So step four, I use solid Python to drive OpenSCAD to basically take these font shapes, extrude them, and then move them into the keycap surface and subtract the two shapes from each other to carve out those shapes that you see there. So uh, all free tools. Now, there's Runic software that I wanted, uh, but there was no space for it left in the kernel and basic ROMs because those are pretty constrained. Uh, so I thought it was time to create a cartridge as well to give me some more functionality. And I call all that RuneUtil. And as you can see in the top left-hand picture, it is very satisfying when you have a 3D print that is dialed in in such a way that the supports just peel away when you lift it off the print bed. That's always a good feeling. The software was EEPROM burned and put on an old version of the Versa 64 cardboard. Those not familiar with the Versa 64 card, it's an open source hardware project by uh, Petter Hands for creating uh, simple cartridges. Uh, as you can see down there in that boot screen for the cartridge, uh, it boots with 30719 bytes free. This is 8K short of the usual uh, familiar 38911. Uh, when I get some time, I'm going to start playing with the cardboards that allow software control over the 8K ROM banking, and that's going to fix that. So, with the RuneUtil cartridge, you can automatically create your ligatures. You can see right here I had a bunch of text. I didn't use any of the two-letter symbols, and all I have to do is press F1, and it will do all of that for me. So, let's see that in action. I love this uh, Pressament Galaxy Purple Filament. It's very forgiving material to print with. So in it goes. Now I'm typing, this is a test. You can see it starts with TH when I move the cursor back here. There it is, that's a ligature. And it ends with ST, also a ligature. So when I press F1, there, it automatically fixes any of this text that's on the screen. 
So as I say here, yeah, that's the only utility I have so far. I think it would be cool if there was a runic native version of computes a word processor speed script that was available on lots of different 8-bit machines back in the day. Uh, Ubibium offers this huge leg up he has out on GitHub, um, an assemblable version of that. So that would make an excellent starting point for me. So like any Ultima game, this project took way longer to complete than expected. For those who don't know, when you complete an Ultima game, which is of course way harder back in the pre-Google days, the game told you to report thy feet unto Lord British. And it would give you contact information for doing exactly that. Uh, Gary and team would then send you something in the mail that would recognize your achievement, a certificate. Now, what's cool is that Garriott still responds to people who report their game completions on Twitter. So naturally, I had to report my feet there as well. And he responded, which is awesome. He says, you've achieved a mighty feat indeed. That was cool. Uh, I got a lot of other responses as well, both on Twitter and Facebook. And surprisingly, no one left me a detailed message about how I was having fun the wrong way, which is normally what happens when I post my useless projects. So maybe people are relaxing these days. Anyway, if you are watching this, Mr. Garriott, uh, know that as a thank you for great childhood Ultima memories, I would happily craft a second Runic Commodore 64 for you. I know you're an Apple II guy, but maybe you'll make an exception. So some final comments. First of all, this was a great project. I actually got to hack on ROMs that were coded by Bill Gates himself and Paul Allen. Uh, how often do you get to do that? Uh, if you want to see Bill Gates' code in more detail, the kinds of things I was messing with, I have a page table link there for you. The hardest parts of the project is, at the time when I first started, I lacked a lot of 3D printing troubleshooting skills. I definitely picked up a large number of them along the way. Got some great advice from the CRX gang and the private Discord channels. Uh, no, I did not restore, resort to a hairspray or glue stick to solve my problems. OpenSCAD had a lot of confusing assertion errors that would happen from its depths that made no sense to me. You couldn't tell what caused it. That tip to rebuild the models in Fusion 360, maybe that's obvious to you out there, but that was new to me. So a big thanks goes to Tessa Del Mar, whoever you are, on the Reddit OpenSCAD uh, forum. That was very, very helpful. Uh, additional thanks to Fizzy Magic and to Cran, the de facto leader of UDIC, Robin 8-Bit Show and Tell, and to Joe for giving my draft slides a look over before I presented. Also, of course, to Yuri for both the hardware and press of printed support. Uh, he's always there to help out when I get stuck on things. And what's next? First of all, a call anybody out there want to take Micro Dragon's runic keycap font and add kerning to it. That would be really useful. That would have improved things. I just didn't make the time to do that. Uh, I would like to expand the ever-growing library of Runic-enabled software. And I've already received, as I posted these things on social media as little teasers, uh, lots of requests for the Python source and the STL files, so I'll be trying to get those all up on GitHub very soon. So, thank you for attending. Right after the Ken Arnold bumper music, I'll be available for any questions or comments that you might have. Thanks. Thanks.